Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. We have a special episode for you this morning and there's a lot to get to. J.K. Rowling continues to speak the truth about transgender, quote, women, after Scotland's hate crime law went into effect that criminalizes threatening, abusive, or insulting behavior. Plus, Shakira speaks out on behalf of her sons over the hugely popular Barbie movie, and Meghan Markle remains in the spotlight. I wonder how that happened. We'll bring you the very latest. Here to discuss it all and more, Daily Mail columnist and one of our very favorites on all things culture, Maureen Callahan, with me right here in the studio. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. There are common sense reasons gold is pushing to all-time highs right now. The cost of goods continues to rise, for one. The national debt continues to skyrocket, too. Now above $34 trillion. It's hard to even fathom. Causing many to worry when this house of cards is going to come crashing down. And then there's our presidential election, and this year, uh, that's going to have massive implications on the future of this country. All of this can add up to instability and uncertainty. And that is why many Americans are turning to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? One option you could consider is to secure a portion of your savings with gold from Birch Gold. Text MK to 989898 and get your free info kit. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold without costing you anything. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. Text MK to 989898 to claim your free info kit and learn how you might protect your savings from uncertainty today. Hi. Hi. Great to see you. Great to see you. So I love that J.K. Rowling saw this so-called hate law and said, she was out of Scotland at the time, but said, um, bring it on. Mm -hmm. And actually said, I'm saying all the things, like made a point of tweeting all the things and said, I'm coming back, arrest me. Mm -hmm. To the point where the police had to be like, we're not gonna arrest you. She called their bluff. Right. We hope it's a bluff. Right. It might not be a bluff if you're not a billionaire mm -hmm. with her Twitter following. Mm -hmm. But what do you make of this nonsense? It's so interesting. I think J.K. Rowling actually really was hoping to be arrested. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think this is one of the most incredible second acts we've ever seen uh, with someone who is already such a cultural powerhouse. I mean, this will be in the top of her obituary someday, mm. what she did in terms of advocating for biological women. And what she is pointing out is the inherent absurdity of this hate crime law, which went into effect on April Fool's Day, which provides protections for every single group but women. Right. But women. So, you know, the two examples that she was sure to bring to the fore, which were, one was a uh, convicted rapist, had raped two women, um, and while awaiting sentencing, had decided he was going to change gender. Oh Even his ex-wife said, never expressed an iota of interest in becoming a woman. By the way, raped me while we were married. Uh, and the second was a, a, convict, a convicted pedophile um, who had been, he had assaulted a 10-year-old girl in a bathroom. Uh and, and was also saying, hey, now I'm a woman and I'd like to be housed in a female jail, you know, wonder why. Um, so the notion that she should be pilloried for standing up for women when those voices are few and far between is um, it's absurd. Yeah. You know? it, it's so crazy. This just, I was just reminded years ago, I, I don't even think I had a show in the primetime of Fox. Mm -hmm. I went on O'Reilly and we were talking about this trans prisoner. Mm -hmm. It was a man who was demanding, I think the state of California pay for his sex reassignment surgery, mm -hmm. so-called. And um, I mean, this is the, as, as somebody once said, uh, ugly as a man, outrageous as a woman. And <laughs> this was like the most unattractive person you've ever laid eyes on. And I commented on that on Fox News and Media Matters must have devoted, I don't know how many pages and updates to what a disgusting person I was because I was pointing out how ugly this man was. And he was in prison for life. He had committed murder. It was like, could you please keep your eye on the ball? And I'm having that same feeling right now. We're talking about convicted pedophiles, convicted rapists being put into a woman's prison 
And I don't care if they identified as a woman for the past 20 years. Who You're not. You've been living your life as male. And the, you know, the, but the late conversion makes it even more in your face to the point where if we can't speak out about it, it's not just offensive to us, it's endangering. You know, so this may sound tangential, but I do think it's relevant. And I was thinking about this, knowing we were going to be discussing this. One of my favorite books and one that I think every woman should read is The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. I love that book. It's incredible. And in that book, he talks about, as a woman moving through the world, you should know that anytime a man makes you feel uncomfortable, whether it's I'll help you with your bags or I'll give you a lift. I don't know you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. That's how we've been conditioned as women. That there is no decent man on the planet who would ever want a woman to feel uncomfortable. So that should be your warning sign number one. So my question would be for any man who late in life is transitioning, knowing that you're going into female-centric spaces and you are making those women uncomfortable, why is it on the women to make sure you are comfortable? Yeah. You know, we're talking about uh, the NCAA lawsuit, which was just filed. Riley Gaines and others saying, Claiming why did you make us compete against men? Right. And Leah Thomas, who is intact uh, in the locker room, you know, according to several women there, proudly displaying her genitalia, knowing it was making the other females uncomfortable, some of whom went and changed in the janitor's closet for privacy. In what world is this fair to women, to girls and women? Yeah. This is what we saw recently at Planet Fitness. Libs of TikTok exposed this, where this man was in there, a 12-year-old girl was in the locker room, and he was posing as a woman as he shaved his beard. His, he's shaving his, he looks like a man. Mm -hmm. There's not even an attempt to look female. And he's shaving his whiskers off of his face while this young prepubescent girl is sitting a stone's throw away. And a woman, a grown woman was also there, took a picture of him. They yanked her, her membership. Right. Her membership got yanked. You know, the, the women get in trouble for complaining as they're about to get arrested in Scotland for complaining. And these fake women get protection. That's why it's so outrageous that women aren't protected in the Scotland bill. It's not that we necessarily need more protection or whatever. I don't know, but fine, because they're like, well, we'll do another bill. It's not, it's not about that. It's that by elevating the trans rights and not doing anything for the women, you've truly elevated them over us. And we already need laws that make clear they're not over us, that if anybody gets a right to reject or say no, it's us because these are not women, they're men. But it's not just even the protections, it's the sort of gaslighting, at least in America, that is sociologically now accepted, right? It's another way of silencing women. There was that famous story last year, and I'm sure it's still ongoing, of the sorority, which had a, a trans member who mm -hmm. was demonstrably male and really sort of, it felt like a woman in drag. There's, you know, this kind of Dylan Mulvaney-ish mocking a bit of femininity. And they all said, we're uncomfortable. But if we say we're uncomfortable, we're the bigots. We're the ones who get tarred and feathered and canceled. And the notion that women and girls have been put so far back so quickly, I mean, I would never have foreseen this oh, no. 10 years ago. It's even. horrifying. Well, that's like, um, is it Wisconsin's governor? I think it's Wisconsin governor. I have it here, Tony Evers. He just refused to sign the law that would protect athletes, female athletes. Yeah, Tony Evers rejected a proposal Tuesday to ban the Via the Hill and the Daily Mail to ban transgender student athletes from competing on sports teams consistent with their gender identity, which basically is the, the green light to boys to cheat. Um, he says it's hateful and discriminatory and says as follows. I believe this bill fails to comport with our Wisconsin values. We expect our kids to treat each other with kindness, respect, empathy, and compassion. But he does not mean that we need to treat the girls that way. He means only trans students or so-called trans students. He doesn't give a damn about empathy or respect for the girls who don't want to change next to a penis. It's... Um it's astonishing that I can't imagine that these schools do not have 
legal teams that say you are one lawsuit away from complete ruin mm-hmm. if a girl is assaulted here. Right. You know, I mean, so I recently wrote um, in yesterday's column or Monday's column about this JK Rowling latest uh, kerfluffle, whatever you want to call it. In Nassau County on Long Island, there's an executive called Bruce Blakeman, I believe, who signed into order. It was an executive order, not a law, protecting biological girls sports and saying this is unfair to girls to have to compete against boys. They are, they are stronger. They are, they have more muscle mass. They have more testosterone. They have all of these advantages. And that was assailed by none other than Letitia James, New York's first female attorney general. What a turncoat. Mm. On the one hand, she's all about, let's take Trump down. You know, he's a misogynist. He's all of these things. And yet on the other hand, she's throwing young girls under the bus. You're so right. She was behind the Harvey Weinstein prosecutions. Yeah, you're exactly right. When it comes, when the chips are are down, you're talking about minor females. Mm -hmm. Her woke bona fides matter more than her actual caring for women, for, for girls. There is a case in the news right now. Okay, this is, I want to make sure I get it right. Athlete Cece Teffler, born Craig. Uh, and Cece Tef- Teffler, Telfer, displaced college women in the finals of a women's invitational meet in Boston last month. We're talking about track and field. Uh, Teffler, the first openly trans identifying male meaning a man who identifies as a female, to win a women's NCAA national title in the 400-meter hurdles ran unattached, which I think means not backed by a school. Uh, they, he bumped a female athlete out of the finals and then went on from there. He has been running track since grade school. He is... Well, let me, I'm not even going to give you a description. Let me just show you the picture. You see if you can guess which one is formerly Craig, now Cece. Which one of these might be a man? Hmm. Is it hard to tell? Could it be the one who's six foot two? Yeah, that's Craig. And Craig is, uh, was on the university's male track and field team at University of New Hampshire for three years. This is not somebody who like is prepubescent where the bodies actually are closer to the same. Um, ran for University of New Hampshire uh, as a man, ranked 200th and 390th respectively among division two men in the 400 hurdles. And after transitioning as I pointed out, qualified for the NCAA Women's Division II Outdoor Track and Field Championships during his senior year. The senior year, like right after. Finishing it up, uh, Let's Run.com reports that Telfer ran slightly faster in the 400 hurdles competing as a man than as a woman. So he was a teensy, like a second better when he was running male, 57.34 seconds versus 57.53 seconds. So I mean, barely. So the point is he lost nothing right. in his transition. Uh, and that's even though the men's hurdles are six inches taller than the women's. But when he ran as a man, he did not even score at the conference meet. And then um, when he ran as a woman, he became mm-hmm. a record setter, NCAA winner, and so on. Now, by the way, according to the Daily Mail, CC, formerly Craig, is set to release a memoir later this year, celebrating how, quote, she became the first openly trans, quote, woman to win an NCAA title. This is cheating. It's, you know, all you have to do, Megan, is look, I was looking at that picture that you just put up. The body language, the demeanor, the expressions of the two female athletes on either side, they're already defeated. They know they have no shot. Let's see that again. They have no shot. What are they working for and sacrificing for and just putting, uh, look at this. You're right. Look at this. Why Why are they being put through this pantomime, through this, it just, it's it, the race is over, is over before it's begun. We know who's going to win. And the, and the demeanor of Cece, which is just sort of like, well, it's all, it's all powerful. It's yeah. all, I'm here. 
here's a video. Mm -hmm. He's jumping up and down. He's psyched. He's ready to go. And these, um, the look, hair flip is they, key. They, they yeah. look like little people next to him. Oh yeah. They look like children. Yeah. Next to this grown man who they have to run against. Otherwise, like Leah Thomas and what he put people like Riley mm -hmm. Gaines through, their lives will be ruined. They'll be called bigots. They won't get job offers, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. And you wonder about the integrity athletically and otherwise of anyone who could compete knowing that the chips are so stacked in their favor mm -hmm. and against these girls. Again, I don't understand it. You know, you were talking about this a few days ago. You never see this the other way around. Mm -mm. We don't see it the other way around, no. which should tell us a lot. And I just wonder, you know, that clip that you just played of Hillary, who's out there promoting suffs, right? Which sounds like just the worst Broadway musical ever. <laughs> Suffragists. <laughs> oh, my oh my God. Oh my God. No. Where is she on this? Yeah. Where are our leading female voices mm -hmm. on this crisis? Where's our J.K. Rowling? Where is our J.K. Rowling? Great you know, Question. There's Mar Martina Navratilova who stuck a toe in these waters mm -hmm. and then got shamed, then immediately dialed it back. She's a leftist. So it would be nice if she would maintain the voice, right? But she eventually came back around, mm -hmm. right? After many other women did it, she finally found the stones to actually do something about it. Okay, fine. We'll take her support. Um, who? Where are billionaires? Where's fucking Oprah? Where is Oprah? Well, she's doing her Ozempic apology tour right now. So maybe <laughs> she's when busy. she's done busy. with that. Where's Michelle Obama? Oh, where's Michelle? Yeah. Where, where are all of our female billionaires like J.K. Rowling, right? She's not one of ours. Right. She's from the UK. Right. Where are the American female billionaires to come out and say something about this? No one. We don't have that person. We don't. It's, 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 this is where we are culturally. We are, we live in Wokistan. And I don't know at what point the the needle will be forced backwards. But, you know, even to see Joe Biden back on his heels a bit, you know, over this Easter weekend mm, thing. It was interesting. Right? Trans Day of Visibility, which apparently 15 years ago was designated as March 31st, mm -hmm. but this year it happened to fall on Easter. He sent out a tweet, celebrate, I see you, I value you to all the trans people. On Easter Sunday, I understand it wasn't scheduled by him, but he did it. He celebrated it on this holy holiday for Christians without apology and really just kind of said, mm, it wasn't it wasn't my idea, but I did it. Right, but he he felt the need to, to backtrack. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're seeing all the sort of uh, the winds of change as the election gets closer and closer. And it struck me that instead of doubling down, he backed off a little bit. Interesting, because he put out the statement saying, I didn't create it. It wasn't mine. Wasn't me, wasn't me. It was, you know, my... Staff that's really running the show. We all know that, you know? We have a side of it. Hold on, let's watch. Sir, Speaker Johnson said you betrayed the tenet of Easter by proclaiming Sunday, Easter Sunday, as Transgender Day. He called it outrageous and abhorrent. What do you say to Speaker Johnson? He's thoroughly uninformed. Uninformed how? I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I mean, I don't know what to say. He's, you think he's getting the message? No, I just think he's confused at any given moment. <laughs> and, you know. We can't read too much into it. I, I don't. I mean, I, I I was actually more struck by him standing shoulder to shoulder with Hunter on the White House lawn yeah. on Easter. Yeah. And Hunter's just sort of complete pride and arrogance and being there instead of, you know, the political liability that he the is. The nerve, the nerve to invite him and have him around people's, you know, children. children. Yeah, like I wouldn't bring my 15-year-old kid if I were you. I wouldn't bring my 15-year-old kid around either one of them. <laughs> Hair sniffing Joe, Hunter with his own peccadilloes. No, it's absolutely true. not. No, he was interviewed by Al Roker and he said like, what's your favorite memory of these things? And Joe Biden was like, my favorite memory was this little girl. I'm like, oh God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went from there. Uh, yeah, so that was Trans Day of Visibility. Uh, while we're on the subject of women and and successful ones, Shakira. Mm -hmm. I, I like Shakira. I actually, I almost never go to concerts, but mm -hmm. I have been to a Shakira concert. Um, I'm not over the fact that I was forced to see Shakira's vag at the Super Bowl performance a couple years ago with my then six-year-old 
in the uh, room, but <laughs> I, I'll forgive her. Okay. I'll forgive her, I guess, because I like what she's saying here, where she spoke out about the movie Barbie. Mm -hmm. She saw the movie Barbie and had some thoughts, which she shared. Um, here's a here's a clip from the movie so you can see where she's coming from. Never got a Ken. That's because Ken is totally superfluous. <laughs> I didn't say that. Women hold all major positions of power, control all the money. Basically everything that men do in your world, women do in ours. I mean, that sounds kind of cool. Okay, so she gives an interview to Allure. The title of the piece is Shakira's She-Wolf Feminism, pointing out she's the mother of two boys. She's separated from their father. Um, they broke up amid allegations that he was cheating on her. And in the piece, she's asked about this movie. Now I can't help but ask a question that's been on my mind since we began this conversation. Did you watch the movie Barbie? What, like, why would you ask that? Okay, but in any event, <laughs> I watched it. Yeah, long pause. And my sons absolutely hated it. They felt it was emasculating. And I agree to a certain extent. I'm raising two boys. I want them to feel powerful too, while respecting women. I like pop culture when it attempts to empower women without robbing men of their possibility to be men, to also protect and provide. I believe in giving women all the tools and the trust that we can do it all without losing our essence, without losing our femininity. I think that men have a purpose in society and women have another purpose as well. We complement each other and that complement should not be lost. Question, just because a woman can do it all doesn't mean she should. Why not share the load? And this is her, okay. Why not share the load with people who deserve to carry it, who have a duty to carry it as well? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, it goes on from there. So. She's been getting some blowback for this. I think, you know, most conservatives like what she's saying, but I, it's no coincidence probably, Maureen, that she's like a Latin woman, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think like they're fine with more of traditional roles. Mm -hmm. And in this country, we shame young women who feel any attraction to that as somehow, mm -hmm. somehow wrong, other, or backward. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I love an original take on something that the hive mind has already come to an agreement upon. And I love someone who's sort of willing to go against that sort of prevailing opinion. Um, my biggest problem with Barbie is I thought it was mediocre and dull. And if I had to hear one more time, the valorization of that soliloquy in there, that America Ferrara soliloquy mm -hmm. about, Oh, if you're, if you're a woman, if you're, you're aggressive, you're a bitch, but if a man does it, he's strong. It's like, that is the whoriest thing that has been going around <laughs> since the early seventies. And it was treated as though Greta Gerwig had like gone to the Mount yes. and God had given her this on a tablet <laughs> and she came back down. And then we all had to sit through the Oscars in which Barbie, which won, I think nothing, mm -hmm. maybe one award, maybe, but was at every song, turn. Best song. At every turn, it was Barbie this, Barbie that, Barbie this, Barbie that. And it wasn't the best movie of the year by a long shot. You know, I think Barbie was sort of attempting to sort of be this overcorrection for girls and women of feeling, you know, yes, you can do it all. Or, you know, if women ran the world, what a, what a sort of utopia that might be like. But Wonder Woman also came out several years ago and that was sort of mm. that message as well. And I just think that... There is something to what Shakira is saying, the sort of, the 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 way that the men were sort of portrayed as bumbling idiots, Yeah, you know? Um, you yeah. can fight back against this. You really can. I never saw Barbie, but my daughter did. And before she went, we talked about, you know, what I'd heard about the movie and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of what to look out for. And she came back and she was like, eh. She was like, it, it seemed very anti-boy. Interesting. Yeah, that, that was her takeaway. That is fascinating. And she's got two brothers and a father who she loves. Mm -hmm. It's like, you you can sort of turn, we don't have to go hardcore. I don't, I'm not trying to turn my kids into activists at all, but I do want them to be aware of these messages as they're coming across the transom. And I also think that moms of both girls and boys are gonna be the solution in part to this problem, right? Because like, I don't want my daughter to get sexually harassed. I don't want her to have her job staked on her sleeping with the boss. Um, but I also don't want my sons to go through college having to s sign consent agreements with women before they have their sexual experiences or whatever it is they choose to have in right. college. Right, right? Right, absolutely. So, you know, the problem with Barbie per Shakira is when it feels less like an entertainment and more like a polemic, mm. right? Yeah. And I think 
there is something to that. And I think we're going to see a little bit more of it because apparently there's going to be a Barbie 2. Oh God. I mean, it made over a billion dollars. So here we are. Yeah, we're going to so have Barbie well. 2. And I'd love to see what they're going to do to Ken next, right? <laughs> like how are they going to spit roast Ken? <laughs> okay. Now this is interesting because James Carville was out there on his, I guess he has a podcast talking mm-hmm. about what's happening with men, male voters and the Democrats. And I do think it's connected to kind of the themes that we're discussing. I'll play that next. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Well, Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Sadly, Delta was just one of many animals that need help. And this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They have rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, a home. April marks 45 years since Leo rescued Delta. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to do what it does. And if you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner because there are tax benefits to helping. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. That's deltarescue.org. So James Carville comes out and, you know, he's one of those Democrats who's, he hasn't gone woke. Mm -hmm. He's not like annoyingly sanctimonious and lecturing Mm -hmm. us all the time. Um, And he is pretty good at diagnosing what problems the Democrats are facing. Mm -hmm. And he posted the following on his YouTube show the other day. Watch this. You know, I've been very vocal about this. Uh, it's, it's horrifying. Our numbers among younger voters, our, 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 particularly you know, uh, black, younger blacks, younger Latinos or whatever, but whatever younger, I don't like, younger people of color, particularly males. We're not shedding them. They're, they're leaving in the droves. Okay, so he doesn't spit it out as articulately as perhaps we'd, we'd like, but <laughs> he's not wrong, right? The younger voters, the men in particular, are mm-hmm. leaving, white, black, Hispanic. Mm-hmm. And it, I, it's not directly related to Barbie, but it's kind of all part of the same problem. What do you think it is, particularly with the Democrats and their messaging right now? I think they're sanctimonious lecturing, scolding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Men are bad. I mean, that's really like, who, what, what man wants to watch Ken and hear that messaging? You know, like who gets a kick out of that? And I think it's also like, we were looking at the uh, podcast numbers the other day morning mm-hmm. and our show's doing great. Thank mm-hmm. God, thank mm-hmm. God. And thanks to all of you. But you look at like Joe Rogan. Right. He's a monster, monster. His downloads are like in the, I don't know, several, several double digit millions and everybody else is way below. Right. But most of the top podcasters are men who are speaking to these guys who feel disaffected, rejected, mm-hmm. blamed for everything. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the scourge of everything. Like Jordan Peterson is very popular, right. I think for the same reason. And I do think it is mostly leftist women who are pushing this message. You know, conservative women, they're not out there bashing men in every turn. Yeah, It's like these Upper West Side liberals who are like, you know, down with the patriarchy. Yeah, yeah. It's not to say, you and I have talked many times, it's not to say that women don't have real problems, right? that we've cleaned up all work environments and that we have all the same advantages, perfectly equal. We don't. There's definitely some more work to be done, but we, we've we overcorrected in some areas yeah. to now where the message is, just assume men are the problem. Yeah. Just assume your boy's not getting any of the college because he's a boy. Yeah. And never mind if he's a white boy. Yeah. You know, like, and I think they're feeling it. They're feeling it across all age groups. You know, I remember having this conversation with you. I don't remember if it was on air or not, but I was talking about one of my best friends who she and her family left Brooklyn several years ago for New Jersey. And she said, I am not going to have my child, my son, educated in a system that tells him because he is a young, white, blonde, blue-eyed, straight male, that he is the problem. And I thought, wow, like to identify that so early and to know that that is what's coming down the pike for him. 
And I think you're right. I think there is, and it's, it's, it's akin to what we were talking about earlier, where as women, we sometimes feel, oh, when it comes to something like the trans issue, if we speak up about it, we're bigots, we're transphobes. I've been called every name in the book. I'm sure you have too. And I feel like for men, it must be this silent majority of like, but we're not the problem. Why don't we get to be men? Why are, why even, there was just an amazing story I was reading about the um, the rise in in blue collar work and the push for more vocational schools mm-hmm. instead of this constant push down the line for a higher education for four-year college or university. And those jobs will never be going away. You know, as we as we've seen in America, all too recently, our infrastructure is crumbling. Mm-hmm. And yet these are not, a, this is not a cohort that the Democrats want to talk to anymore. They're not talking to them. They're not talking at them. They're just bypassing them. And I think that's exactly who James Carville is talking about. And also when it comes to shedding Blacks, Latinos, like let's talk about the anti-cop movement. Let's talk about the soft on crime movement. Who is that hurting the most? That's hurting young, poor, dispossessed Blacks and Latinos the most. Look at The View the other day. Let's pull this soundbite over, guys. Whoopi Goldberg was angry when uh, Alyssa Farah, who's the sort of sort of conservative on Token the show. Token conservative. Yeah. Um, Alyssa pointed out that Trump went to the funeral um, of Officer Diller. Yes. On Long Island. And Joe Biden went to a podcast. Yes. And- Look at Whoopi Goldberg's reaction to Trump doing that while while Biden was out, you know, mm-hmm. f- getting more campaign donations and promoting himself on that podcast. Look at this. This past week, he had a brief good political moment for a Republican. He attended a slain NYPD officer's funeral to juxtapose, you know, what he was framing as Biden hobnobbing with celebrities. Choose what you like there, but for Republicans, it was good imagery. Really? One day later, yes. I, 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 and I'm asking that because I was so offended. I because don't, this man, because okay. you know who showed up. Yeah. And he was, whether he was asked or not, this is a man who didn't, didn't care what happened to the officers on January 6th. Okay. She promotes Joe Biden and Kamala Harris every day Mm -hmm. on that show. Kamala Harris called Jacob Blake a hero. Kamala Harris was getting involved on the side of the rebel rousers, the accused criminals during the BLM riots. Mm -hmm. That Jacob Blake... Pulled a knife on cops. It was Mm -hmm. admitted on her network, ABC, in an interview with Michael Strahan. Mm -hmm. Uh, They can't tolerate a moment of a politician paying his respects to a fallen cop because Trump wasn't supportive enough of the cops who were, yes, in danger on J6. How does that explain their behavior on a daily basis toward Harris, toward Biden, toward AOC, toward all of the left, including their own show, Sonny Hostin, who supported the BLM riots, Mm -hmm. endangering and hurting thousands of cops, Mm -hmm. thousands of them. Mm -hmm. The hypocrisy is rank. The hypocrisy is rank. Whataboutism is the refuge of cowards. I hate it when something comes up and it's a what about this, what about that? Trump... There were there were a couple of things about that this weekend again, and this took place over Easter weekend, and it was incredibly tragic. Trump went to that wake and was welcomed there, spoke to the widow, spoke to the family. When he was asked what possible good could come out of this tragedy, he said the only good thing that could come out of this is that there are stronger and tougher laws on the books to keep criminals like this off the streets. This guy had a record. This was a traffic stop. This was the father of a one-year-old. Yeah. Contrast that with Kathy Hochul showing up at that wake and she was not wanted and she was filmed outside that funeral home and there was somebody who attended that wake who had words with her who was very upset and we later learned basically she was told, you have blood on your hands. This is not enough to get 
New York's governor, assembly, legislature. Nobody will move on this stuff. Nobody will move on these soft on crime policies. I'm sure you see this every day. Every day in New York, women are getting punched in the, the face. face walking down the streets. This is now the cost of doing business for being a woman in New York City. Yeah. It comes at random, unexpected mm -hmm. times. You get attacked from behind, from the front with massive blows. It's not, mm -hmm. not that any punch would be enjoyable, but massive blows to the face where women have welts as big as this. Even Bethany Frankel came out and um, tweeted that she had been attacked. I mean, she's well known. I don't know. Then she deleted. I'm suspect of Bethany. I, don't know. I, don't I think know. if Bethany Frankel had been attacked, she would have been live streaming from her nearest five star urgent clinic. <laughs> That's okay. just me. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but the point is, it's happening in mm -hmm. this city, and which is just completely dangerous now. And in a way, you know, I had the fifth column on last week, and we were talking about this. Mm -hmm. We were talking about how terrifying the subways are now. And Michael Moynihan, who's part of the fifth column. Mm -hmm texted me later that day or the next day, a video of him on the subway with lunatics on there threatening the passengers, behaving in a very disturbing manner. It's just, that's because of Whoopi's side of the aisle. I'm sorry, but that the people that she supports on a day-to-day -day basis are the ones who put these no cash bail mm -hmm. you know, policies in place and soft on crime prosecutors in place mm -hmm. where these people just go in and before the cops can fill out the paperwork, they're already back out. So I really don't want to hear her indignation about January 6th. I don't support what happened on January 6th, and I've been you know, critical of it from the beginning. But this is ridiculous because she doesn't give two shits about the thousands, literally thousands of cops who've been hurt since the beginning of BLM. It's just, it's infuriating. Oh, anyway. Okay. So that's, that's them. Something else. Yes. I know this is weird, but I told Abby before you came, make sure you get the article to Maureen about the man with a penis and a vagina. <laughs> she did. She got it to me. <laughs> and she's like, got it. Get Maureen, the man with the penis and the vagina. <laughs> Can I tell you my first reaction? But Overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> my book is called Settle for More. Well, there you go. Maybe, <laughs> maybe took a lesson. Maybe book noted some stuff. Okay. So I did not bring this up exactly in the trans discussion because it, to me, this is about a, a, a bigger, different thing. So this is in Canada, where they've truly gone crazy on these issues. Um, in Canada, a quote, non-binary person who is 33 years old, this is from the Daily Mail, uh, wants the taxpayers to fund his, it's a biological male, $70,000 surgery to get a vagina. And he wants to keep his penis. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> wants to keep the pee. Uh, he lives in Ontario. He's 33, born male, identifies as non-binary, says he's literally a mix. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, got originally denied the taxpayer money because it's taxpayer right. healthcare up there, denied. And then uh, uh, an appellate court overruled the denial and said, you should get it. Uh, and now it, he's appealing it or the other side's appealing. One of them's appealing it. So it's not, it's not yet settled. Uh, this is what his lawyer writes. It is very important for KS, which is how he's going, to have a vagina for her personal interpretation of her gender expression. Okay, no female has to petition a court for her vagina. <laughs> it, comes, <laughs> it comes along with everything else. <laughs> it has to petition the court for a vagina. It's very important for her personal interpretation of her gender expression, but she also wishes to maintain her penis. Her penis, writes the doctor who's supporting KS. KS is trans feminine, but not completely on the feminine end of the spectrum. And for this reason, it's important for her to have a vagina while maintaining a penis. Okay, there's so many places that you could go with mm -hmm. this piece of news. Mm -hmm. um, the place that I that I went to it when I read this article, Maureen, was we are in some sort of bizarre other world now on what we're doing to one another. Mm -hmm. Like that this is somehow acceptable because this person wants to get this surgery in the United States at a clinic in Texas, which says it does about 10 of these a year. Wow. In Austin, Texas. So there are multiple people walking around right now by choice, having created some artificial penis mm -hmm. to match the vagina or artificial mm -hmm. vagina to match the penis. Both are there. 
Both are somewhat functional. And I, I can't help but think back to the warnings that seemed extreme at the time from people like O'Reilly mm-hmm. on Fox. Like, if we start going down this line, we're going to wind up saying yes to some very extreme behaviors that nobody wants to normalize. And I have to say, this seems like one of them. This, as a moral, as an ethical, as a religious, I can't, like, matter should not be allowed. We should not be a society that says, sure, have all the body parts you want. Uh, There's another trend to get rid of your belly button and also a trend to get rid of all genitals. You have no genitals whatsoever. So it's Ken. Uh, Right, exactly. He has nothing. Good good point. He has nothing, yeah. This, I I don't mean to be mean, Mm -hmm. but this is freaky. This is downright freaky. It's disturbing. This person could be teaching your kid in school. This person could be, moving in next door to you. And next thing you know, at a cocktail party, he's telling you all about his penis and vagina. I miss the days when there were societal norms against this most extreme behavior. Now we've crossed over to where it's taxpayer funded. It's so it's so crazy. I did not know that there was a place in Texas that was performing about 10 of these a year. And my my initial thing is sort of, you know, surgery is surgery. It's serious business. And it really should be sort of your last option no matter what is going on. Um, it's the percentage of people, I would love to know the percentage of people because what this automatically made me think of, I was doing a little reading on my way here and it was making me think of, you know, and these are again like, um, it's a very marginal number, but the number of children, say, who are born intersex, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Born with both genitalia. And what they used to do was the doctors would decide upon birth which sex the baby should be. They would be raised that way. And then later in life, they would have gender confusion and they would say, I, I feel more this. And it would they would learn what happened to them. And I think just before, for those, those intersex people, I don't think they have both a penis and a vagina. I think generally they have female sex organs and a penis. I don't know for sure. I haven't actually done a deep dive on this, but that's my understanding of intersex. I don't know that you have both an active penis and a vagina. I don't know that you do. I think that there also may be testes that don't drop, mm-hmm. something like that. But that's one thing. If you, if, mm-hmm. if through some genetic issue in, mm-hmm. in utero, you are born like that. Mm-hmm. Those people deserve empathy and kindness. This is like a surgical creation by a doctor who's got a Hippocratic oath to do no harm. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you want to go male to female in the operation department, Mm -hmm. they usually take your penis, cut it off, forgive me guys, and try to transform it into something that looks like a vag. Here, they've got to take all that tissue because this guy wants to have it all from the colon, from the abdomen. And this is, we've seen, it's been reported, uh, a 16 year old boy die when they tried to create um, a a, a mm-hmm. vagina out of a penis because mm-hmm. he didn't have enough penile mm-hmm. material thanks to all the cross-sex hormones and the, and the uh, puberty blockers. And when they take that material from a colon, you can die. So this is a dangerous thing to have done to yourself too. And we're treating it like it's a nose job. Right, right, right. We're treating it sort of like you're going to your dermatologist and getting a little lip filler and right. what have you. It's a little laser. Tweakment, you know, and I think- I think a lot of this will, you know, we're seeing this in Europe and I I, I love seeing this in Europe because there's a, a, a branch of, of a, the American elite that love to look at Europe as so superior to us in every way. And they have pulled way back on medicalizing children and teenagers. They won't do it. They won't do it. Now. And France is the latest country to begin really pulling back and saying like, no, this is too damaging. It's causing harm. We should be coming at this as a mental, emotional, psychological issue first. And in America, we're not there yet, you know? And I was so struck, I don't know if you saw this, by the New York Times, that piece that Pamela Paul wrote, Yeah, that it was like four pages long on detransitioning. And these young people who said, as a teenager or a young, like adolescent, pubescent, went to my doctor, exhibited confusion, the medical industrial complex put me on a conveyor belt. This was the answer. This was the only answer. It's a firm, a firm, a firm. And you're talking about children and teenagers with incredibly plastic minds. 
anybody who's been through adolescence knows it's one of the traumatic things, <laughs> most traumatic things you can ever go through. Yeah. Can you imagine making a decision that's going to affect you medically for the rest of your life? No, no. And the parents who allow it. Yeah. It's just like, I- I'm sorry, but this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not like uh, somebody who's very preachy when it comes to religion, but to me, this feels like evil somehow that there'd be a doctor who would do this to a person who's obviously sick um, and like a medical complex that says, we'll support you in this obvious severe mental illness. And then this person walking around with this secret that we all are supposed to pretend is totally normal and fine. I just like, no, I mean, we've got lines and for me, they're important lines and we should uphold them. Okay. Which weirdly leads me to Lizzo. Mm-hmm. So Lizzo, it's I, I, the transition works because Lizzo is somebody who's been trying to say, it's healthy to be this fat, like body positivity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And okay, that's fine. It's like redefining. I don't believe that it's not healthy, but she's working it to the tune of, I'm sure, you know, over a hundred million dollars probably at this point. And she's got um, all these advantages, right? She's got so many blessings. She get asked, gets asked to perform at Joe Biden's fundraiser last Friday night. Mm -hmm. She does it. Mm -hmm. And within 24 hours, she quits music. Mm -hmm. She sends out her little post. I'm, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm sick of being criticized in the internet. All I try to do is put positivity out there into the world. And what do I get? I get trolled. I quit. Mm -hmm. Well, that lasted about two minutes. (laughs) She's back. Okay. Uh, I didn't quit music. I just quit haters. Okay. No, she quit. Right. Yeah. She's got whatever. She rethought it. But to me, Maureen, this shows something you write about all the time, which is her disgusting sense of entitlement. This is a person who has won Emmys. She's won Grammys. She has her own fashion line. She's now making movies. She had a reality TV series. She is lauded as a as an icon mm-hmm. by every magazine and every entertainment uh, show and publication. Um, she's made probably, like I said, hundreds of millions Mm -hmm. or at least over a hundred million. She's got double platinum, quadruple platinum, seven time platinum albums. She gets celebrated at every turn. She gets asked to appear before three presidents. It's not enough because some people dared to criticize her online. She's got to throw a fit like a little brat and say, I quit. And she's going to be begged back into the business by all of her adoring fans because she doesn't want to traffic in hate. I'm sorry, she went political. She's constantly lecturing us about the body, so it's fine to talk about the body and whether what she's saying is true. And she, like so many of these celebrities, think that their you-know-what doesn't stink, and we're not allowed to weigh in on their controversial behavior or just say we don't like them. Right, right. You know what I thought when I saw that announcement, I quit, I thought, what is really going on behind the scenes. Do you remember several months ago that lawsuit that was filed by all those backup dancers and they were alleging that there was weird sexual stuff going on and and she was bully and, and, you know, that really took her back. Like that, you could tell that there was something really amiss in the house of Lizzo. And which, by the way, all of those accomplishments that you just listed that belong to her are exceedingly vanishingly rare in the cultural landscape to break through all the noise in this incredibly fragmented culture and become a mainstream pop star. It's incredibly difficult. So she's already in the 1% of the 1%. Yeah. So that was initially my thought. And because it also came on the tail end of all of this, these far more explosive allegations against Sean Diddy Combs. Mm -hmm. And I thought somebody's trying to get ahead of something. And perhaps, Mm -hmm. then perhaps having been on stage and ratified by Obama and Clinton and Biden and being among this, you know, rarefied crowd sort of made her rethink withdrawing from the public eye. I mean, who knows? It feels very schizophrenic it doesn't feel like the most sober judgments one might be making within mm-hmm. the span of 48 hours. Good point. Yeah. Well, look, I all I want to hear from Lizzo is thank you. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard. Thanks so much. Really appreciate all my many blessings. I don't want to hear about how she doesn't like online negative comments, Meghan Markle. I mean, that's the problem. Like you put yourself in the public eye, you want fame and fortune. There's a downside. We all know it. Most of us take it like men or women 
and don't go whining, I quit, I'm taking my ball and going home. So as it turns out, she wants more of your money because she's back in the business. <laughs> um, okay, speaking of Meghan Markle, she decided to show up at uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles and do a reading to support literacy. Uh, I guess it was, no, it was a literal uh, annual fundraising at the hospital that aims to create hope and build healthier futures. And she did a little reading, which you can see here. This is one of my favorites. Her great great aunt Rose was a true dynamo who'd worked building airplanes a long time ago. That night as Rosie lay wide-eyed in bed, a daring idea crept into her head. Did you know that cheddar cheese spray keeps the snakes away? Whoa. I didn't know that. So have you ever done a charity event and then do you run and make sure that everybody gets to see it? Uh, in the video and promote it and make sure they know you did the charity event because that seems to be her pattern. I'm amazed she's not reading from the bench. Her, uh, her children's book. book. Her book. <laughs> about her husband being the greatest father on the planet. I mean, no, no, and no. And also I think I cannot look, this may say more about me than it does about her. I doubt it, but I will offer that disclaimer. I cannot look at anything she does without looking at it through the prism of who and what she's trying to poke. Mm. Kate Middleton, as we know, is very sick with cancer. This one shows up at a children's hospital. Mm. You know, it just, it feels cynical. It feels like, look at me, look how magnanimous I am. You know, this is the same woman who uninvited took a camera crew down to Uvalde. You want to talk about a sacred space? Yeah. That is a sacred space. She had zero business being there. You want to help? Why don't you cut a check? You want to help? Why don't you talk to some of your very famous, powerful friends and see what you can do behind the scenes quietly? Yeah. Everything she does has a camera attached to it. And there's a reason. I mean, there. look, I'm a public figure. I do charitable work. I don't put it all over the internet. Unless the person says to me, would you promote it mm -hmm. to draw attention, then I'll do it. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of charitable things that I do that I'm sure you do that other well-known people do. And you don't see us saying, I really would love you to give me credit for it because what I'm doing here is really promoting myself. That's what she is doing in my view. That's what she always does. You can take it to the bank. Oh, it's the famous um, Steinbrenner quote, right? Like George Steinbrenner, one of the great bullies of New York, but who did a lot of charitable work behind the scenes. And I don't know if this was his original saying, but it went something like, if you do something good for somebody else and more than two people know, you did it for the wrong reason. Mm, that's and I love so that. That's so good. It's so perfect. And we know everything. Well, I, would, she, I don't think she says yes unless she knows there's going to be a camera there. Mm -mm. Maureen Callahan, amazing as always. Thanks, Megan. Thank uh, you so much for having me. Pleasure's so all fun. Mine. And why is it whenever you come here, there's terrible weather outside? There's terrible weather. No, but before we wrap up, because we didn't really get into um, which American Riviera Orchard, which oh, Megan's oh, I forthcoming lifestyle yes. brand. I think we're all refreshing constantly, right? <laughs> when is the product line? When is the product line? I did the most digging I could do and I did find something and I thought if anyone should have it, you should have it. Oh God. So I brought it for you. You brought presents? Just, just nothing big, oh. but it's a little teaser to come of what Megan has Wait, in store I, for us. I've got to see this. Oh my God, oh, Valentino. All right. What is in here? Uh, <laughs> American fucking grifters, Montecito. <laughs> <laughs> this is going on my in my main powder room oh, today. Oh my god, a place of honor! <laughs> this is oh my god, <laughs> oh, everyone's gonna want these. Where can we get these, Maureen? This is specially made. Uh, this was specially made, indeed. Um, so I have thoughtful. to give a shout out to some anonymous hero on Reddit who very swiftly took the American Riviera Orchard calligraphy <laughs> and grafted it onto the logo. This is beautiful. Yeah. This is so clever. Yes, this is a website I would go to. Absolutely. I'd buy a million of those things. Let's face it. When they really get hers up and running, we're going to be there every day. She's just the gift that keeps on giving. The greatest performance artist of our time. <laughs> Bye, lady. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Maureen and thanks to all of you for joining me back again uh, later today. See you then.